This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, February 2006. The Country of the Pointed Furs by Sarah Orne Jewett. Chapter 20 Along Shore. One day, as I went along the shore beyond the old wharves and the newer, high-stepped fabric of the steamer landing, I saw that all the boats were beached, and the slack water period of the early afternoon prevailed. Nothing was going on, not even the most leisurely of occupations, like baiting trawls or mending nets, or repairing lobster pots. The very boats seemed to be taking an afternoon nap in the sun. I could hardly discover a distant sail as I looked seaward, except a weather-beaten lobster smack, which seemed to have been taken for a plaything by the light airs that blew about the bay. It drifted and turned about so aimlessly in the wide reach off Burnt Island that I suspected there was nobody at the wheel, or that she might have parted her rusty anchor chain while all the crew were asleep. I watched her for a minute or two. She was the old Miranda, owned by some of the Kaplans, and I knew her by an odd-shaped patch of newish duck that was set into the peak of her dingy mainsail. Her vagaries offered such an exciting subject for conversation that my heart rejoiced at the sound of a hoarse voice behind me. At that moment, before I had time to answer, I saw something large and shapeless flung from the Miranda's deck that splashed the water high against her black side, and my companion gave a satisfied chuckle. The old lobster smack's sail caught the breeze again at that moment, and she moved off down the bay. Turning, I found old Elijah Tilly, who had come softly out of his dark fish-house as if it were a burrow. "'Boy got kind of drowsy steering of her. Monroe, he hove him right overboard. Wake now fast enough,' explained Mr. Tilly, and we laughed together. I was delighted for my part that the vicissitudes and dangers of the Miranda in a rocky channel should have given me this opportunity to make acquaintance with an old fisherman to whom I had never spoken. At first he had seemed to be one of those evasive and uncomfortable persons who are so suspicious of you that they make you almost suspicious of yourself. Mr. Elijah Tilly appeared to regard a stranger with scornful indifference. You might see him standing on the pebble beach or in a fish-house doorway, but when you came nearer he was gone. He was one of the small company of elderly, gaunt-shaped, great fishermen whom I used to like to see leading up a deep-laden boat by the head, as if it were a horse, from the water's edge to the steep slope of the pebble beach. There were four of these large old men at the landing, who were the survivors of an earlier and more vigorous generation. There was an alliance and understanding between them, so close that it was apparently speechless. They gave much time to watching one another's boats go out or come in. They lent a ready hand at tending one another's lobster traps in rough weather. They helped to clean the fish or to sliver porgies for the trawls, as if they were in close partnership. And when a boat came in from deep sea fishing, they were never too far out of the way, and hastened to help carry it ashore two by two, splashing alongside, or holding its steady head, as if it were a willful sea colt. As a matter of fact, no boat could help being steady and waywise under their instant direction and companionship. Abel's boat and Jonathan Bowden's boat were as distinct and experienced personalities as the men themselves, and as inexpressive. Arguments and opinions were unknown to the conversation of these ancient friends. You would as soon have expected to hear small talk in a company of elephants as to hear old Mr. Bowden or Elijah Tilly and their two mates waste breath upon any form of trivial gossip. They made brief statements to one another from time to time. As you came to know them, you wondered more and more that they should talk at all. Speech seemed to be a light and elegant accomplishment, and their unexpected acquaintance with its arts made them of new value to the listener. You felt almost as if a landmark pine should suddenly address you in regard to the weather, or a lofty-minded old camel make a remark as you stood respectfully near him under the circus tent. 
I often wondered a great deal about the inner life and thought of these self-contained old fishermen. Their minds seemed to be fixed upon nature and the elements, rather than upon any contrivances of man, like politics or theology. My friend Captain Bowden, who was the nephew of the oldest of this group, regarded them with deference. But he did not belong to their secret companionship, though he was neither young nor talkative. "'They've gone together ever since they were boys. They know most everything about the sea amongst them,' he told me once. They was always just as you see em now since the memory of man. These ancient seafarers had houses and lands not outwardly different from other Dunnet landing dwellings, and two of them were fathers of families, but their true dwelling places were the sea, and the stony beach that edged its familiar shore, and the fish houses where much salt brine from the mackerel kits had soaked the very timbers into a state of brown permanence and petrification. It had also affected the old fishermen's hard complexions, until one fancied that when death claimed them, it could only be with the aid not of any slender modern dart, but the good serviceable harpoon of a seventeenth-century woodcut. Elijah Tilly was such an evasive, discouraged-looking person, heavy-headed, and stooping so that one could never look him in the face, that even after his friendly exclamation about Monroe Pennell, the Lobster Smacks skipper, and the Sleepy Boy, I did not venture at once to speak again. Mr. Tilly was carrying a small haddock in one hand, and presently shifted it to the other hand, lest it might touch my skirt. I knew that my company was accepted, and we walked together a little way. "'You mean to have a good supper,' I ventured to say, by the way of friendliness. "'Going to have this ere haddock.' "'and some of my baked potatoes. "'Must eat to live,' responded my companion "'with great pleasantness and open approval. "'I found that I had suddenly left the forbidding coast "'and come into the smooth little harbor of friendship. "'You ain't never been up to my place,' said the old man. "'Folks don't come now as they used to. "'No, tain't no use to ask folks now. "'My poor dear, she was a great hand to draw young company.' I remembered that Mrs. Todd had once said that this old fisherman had been sore-stricken and unconsoled at the death of his wife. "'I should like very much to come,' said I. "'Perhaps you are going to be at home later on.' Mr. Tilly agreed by a sober nod, and went his way bent-shouldered and with a rolling gait. There was a new patch high on the shoulder of his waistcoat, which corresponded to the renewing of the Miranda's mainsail down the bay." and I wonder if his own fingers, clumsy with much deep-sea fishing, had set it in. "'Was there a good catch to-day?' I asked, stopping a moment. "'I didn't happen to be on the shore when the boats came in.' "'No, all came in pretty light,' answered Mr. Tilly. "'Addicks and Bowden, they done the best. "'Abel and me, we had been a slim fare. "'We went out early, but not so early as sometimes.' "'Looked like a poor morning. "'I got nine haddock, all small, and seven fish. "'The rest of em got more fish than haddock. "'Well, I don't expect they feel like biting every day. "'We learned to humor em a little, "'and let em have their way about it. "'These plaguy dogfish kind of worry em. "'Mr. Tilly pronounced the last sentence with much sympathy, as if he looked upon himself as a true friend of all the haddock and codfish that lived on the fishing-grounds. And so we parted. Later in the afternoon I went along the beach again until I came to the foot of Mr. Tilly's land, and found his rough track across the cobblestones and rocks to the field edge, where there was a heavy piece of old wreck timber, like a ship's bone, full of tree-nails. From this a little footpath, narrow with one man's treading, led up across the small green field that made Mr. Tilly's whole estate, except a straggling pasture that tilted on edge up the steep hillside beyond the house and road. I could hear the tinkle-tinkle of a cowbell somewhere among the spruces, by which the pasture was being walked over and forested from every side. It was likely to be called the woodlot before long, but the field was unmolested. I could not see a bush or a briar anywhere within its walls, 
and hardly a stray pebble showed itself. This was most surprising in that country of firm ledges, and scattered stones which all the walls that industry could devise had hardly begun to clear away off the land. In the narrow field I noticed some stout stakes, apparently planted at random in the grass, and among the hills of potatoes, but carefully painted yellow and white to match the house, a neat, sharp-edged little dwelling, which looked strangely modern for its owner. I should have much sooner believed that the smart young wholesale egg merchant of the landing was its occupant than Mr. Tilly, since a man's house is really but his larger body, and expresses in a way his nature and character. I went up the field, following the smooth little path to the side door. As for using the front door, that was a matter of great ceremony. The long grass grew close against the high stone step, and a snowberry bush leaned against it, top-heavy with the weight of a morning-glory vine that had managed to take what the fishermen might call a half-hitch about the doorknob. Elijah Tilly came to the side door to receive me. He was knitting a blue yarn stocking without looking on, and was warmly dressed for the season in a thick blue flannel shirt with white crockery buttons, a faded waistcoat and trousers heavily patched at the knees. These were not his fishing clothes. There was something delightful in the grasp of his hand, warm and clean, as if it had never touched anything but the comfortable woolen yarn, instead of cold sea-water and slippery fish. "'What are the painted stakes for down in the field?' I hastened to ask, and he came out a step or two along the path to see, and looked at the stakes as if his attention were called to them for the first time. "'Folks laughed at me when I first bought this place and came here to live,' he explained. "'They said twain't no kind of a field privilege at all. "'No place to raise anything. "'All full of stones. "'I was aware it was good land, and I worked some on it, "'odd times when I didn't have nothing else on hand, "'till I cleared them loose stones all out. "'You never see a prettier place than tis now, now did ye?' "'Well, as for them painted marks, them's my buoys. "'I struck on to some heavy rocks that didn't show none, "'but a plow'd be liable to ground on em, "'and so I catched hold and buoyed em, same's you see. "'They don't trouble me no more, and if they weren't there... "'You haven't been to sea for nothing,' I said, laughing. "'One trade helps another,' said Elijah, with an amiable smile. "'Come right in and sit down.' "'Come in and rest ye,' he exclaimed, and led the way into his comfortable kitchen. The sunshine poured in at the two further windows, and a cat was curled up sound asleep on the table that stood between them. There was a new-looking light oilcloth of a tiled pattern on the floor, and a crockery teapot, large for a household of only one person, stood on the bright stove. I ventured to say that somebody must be a very good housekeeper— "'That's me,' acknowledged the old fisherman with frankness. "'There ain't nobody here but me. "'I try to keep things looking right. "'Same's poor dear left em. "'You sit down here in this chair, "'and you can look off and see the water. "'None of them thought I was going to get along alone. "'No way. "'But I wasn't going to have my house turned upside down "'and all changed about. "'No, not to please nobody.' I was the only one knew just how she liked to have things set. Poor dear, and I said I was going to make shift, and I have made shift. I'd rather tough it out alone. And he sighed heavily, as if to sigh were his familiar consolation. We were both silent for a minute. The old man looked out the window as if he had forgotten I was there. You must miss her very much, I said at last. "'I do, miss her,' he answered and sighed again. "'Folks all keep repeating that time would ease me, but I can't find it does. "'No, I miss her just the same every day.' "'How long is it since she died?' I asked. Eight years now, come the first of October. "'It don't seem near so long. "'I've got a sister that comes and stops long o' me a little spell.' "'spring and fall, and odd times, if I send after her. "'I ain't near so good a hand to sew as I be to knit. 
and she is very quick to set everything to rights. She's a married woman with a family. Her son's folks lives at home, and I can't make no great claim on her time. But it makes me a kind of good excuse when I do send to help her a little. She ain't none too well off. Poor dear always liked her, and we used to contrive our ways together. Tis full as easy to be alone. I set here and think it all over, and think considerable when the weather's bad to go outside. I get so some days it feels as if poor dear might step right back into this kitchen. I keep a-watchin' them doors as if she might step in our airy one. Yes, ma'am, I keep a-lookin' off, and droppin' of my stitches. That's just how it seems. I can't get over losin' of her. No way, nor no how. Yes, ma'am, that's just how it seems to me. I did not say anything, and he did not look up. I get to feeling so sometimes I have to lay everything by and go outdoor. She was a sweet, pretty creature, long she lived, the old man added mournfully. There's that little rocking chair o' hern. I set and notice it and think how strange tis a creature like her should be gone and that chair be here right in its old place. I wish I had known her. Mrs. Todd told me about your wife one day, I said. You'd have liked to come and see her, all the folks did, said poor Elijah. She'd been so pleased to hear everything and see somebody new that took such an interest. She had a kind of gift to make it pleasant for folks. I guess likely Amiri Todd told you she was a pretty woman, especially in her young days. Late years, too. She kept her looks, and come to be so pleasant-looking. There tain't so much better. I shall be done afore a great while. No, I shan't trouble the fish a great sight more. The old widower sat with his head bowed over his knitting, as if he were hastily shortening the very thread of time. The minutes went slowly by. He stopped his work and clasped his hands firmly together. I saw he had forgotten his guest, and I kept the afternoon watch with him. At last he looked up as if but a moment had passed of his continual loneliness. "'Yes, ma'am, I'm one that has seen trouble,' he said, and began to knit again. The visible tribute of his careful housekeeping and the clean bright room, which had once enshrined his wife, and now enshrined her memory, was very moving to me. He had no thought for any one else, or for any other place. I began to see her myself in her home, a delicate-looking, faded little woman, who leaned upon her rough strength and affectionate heart, who was always watching for his boat out of this very window, and who always opened the door and welcomed him when he came home. "'I used to laugh at her, poor dear,' said Elijah, as he read my thought. "'I used to make light of her timid notions. She used to be fearful when I was out in bad weather or baffled about getting ashore.' She used to say the time seemed long to her, but I've found out all about it now. I used to be dreadful thoughtless when I was a young man and the fish was biting well. I'd stay out late some of them days, and I expect she'd watch and watch and lose heart a-waitin'. My heart's alive! What a supper she'd get, and be right there watching from the door, with something over her head if twas cold, waitin' to hear all about it as I come up the field. Lord, how I think of them little things. This was what she called the best room, in this way, he said, presently laying his knitting on the table, and leading the way across the front entry, and unlocking a door, which he threw open with an air of pride. The best room seemed to me a much sadder and more empty place than the kitchen. Its conventionalities lacked the simple perfection of the humbler room, and failed on the side of poor ambition. It was only when one remembered what patient saving, and what high respect for society in the abstract, go to such furnishing, that the little parlor was interesting at all. I could imagine the great day of certain purchases, the bewildering shops of the next large town, the aspiring anxious woman, the clumsy sea-tanned man in his best clothes, so eager to be pleased, but at ease only when they were safe back in the sailboat again, going down the bay with their precious freight, the hoarded money all spent, and nothing to think of but tiller and sail. 
I looked at the unworn carpet, the glass vases on the mantelpiece, with their prim bunches of bleached swamp grass and dusty marsh rosemary, and I could read the history of Mrs. Tilly's best room from its very beginning. You see for yourself what beautiful rugs she could make. Now I'm going to show you her best tea things she thought so much of, said the master of the house, opening the door of a shallow cupboard. That's real chiny, all of it on those two shelves, he told me proudly. I bought it all myself when we was first married in the port of Bordeaux. There never was one single piece of it broke until, well, I used to say long as she lived, there never was a piece broke. But long at the last, I noticed she'd look kind of distressed, and I thought twas count o' me boastin'. When they asked if they should use it when the folks were here to supper, time of her funeral, I knew she'd want to have everything nice, and I said certain. Some of the women they come runnin' to me and called me while they was takin' off the chiny down, and showed me there was one of the cups broken, the pieces wropped up in the paper and pushed way back here, corner of the shelf. They didn't want me to go and think they'd done it. Poor dear, I had to put right out of the house when I see that. I knowed in one minute how twas. We'd got so used to saying twas all there just as I fetched it home, and so when she broke that cup somehow or another, she couldn't frame no words to come and tell me. She couldn't think twould vex me. Twas her own hurt pride. I guess there weren't no other secret other lay between us. The French cups with their gay sprigs of pink and blue, the best tumblers and old-fashioned bowl and tea caddy, and a japanned waiter or two adorned the shelves. These, with a few daguerreotypes in a little square pile, had the closet to themselves, and I was conscious of much pleasure in seeing them. One is shown over many a house in these days where the interest may be more complex, but not more definite. "'Those were her best things, poor dear,' said Elijah, as he locked the door again. "'She told me that last summer before she was taken away "'that she couldn't think of anything more she wanted. "'There was everything in the house, and all her rooms was furnished pretty. "'I was going over to the port and inquired for errands. "'I used to ask her to say what she wanted, cost or no cost. "'She was a very reasonable woman, and twas the place where she'd done all but her extra shopping.' kind of chilled me up when she spoke so satisfied. "'You don't go fishing after Christmas?' I asked as we came back to the bright kitchen. "'No, I take stiddy to my knittin' after January sets in,' said the old seafarer. "'Twain't worth while. Fish make off into deeper water, and you can't stand no such perishin' for the sake of what you get. I leave out a few traps to in sheltered coves, and do a little lobsterin' on fair days. The young fellows brave it out some on em but for me i lay in my winter yarn and set them where twas warm and knit and take my comfort mother learnt me once when i was a lad she was a beautiful knitter herself i was laid up with a bad knee and she said twould take up my time and help her we was a large family they'll buy all the folks can do down here to attic store they say our dunnet stockings is getting to be celebrated up to boston good quality of wool and even knitting or something i've always been called a pretty hand to do netting but seems his master cheap to what they used to be when they was all hand worked i change off to netting long toward spring and i piece up my trawls and lines and get my fishing stuff to rights lobster pots they require attention but i make em up in spring weather when it's warm there in the barn no i ain't one who likes to sit and do nothing you see the rugs poor dear did them she wasn't very partial to knittin old elijah went on after he had counted his stitches our rugs is beginnin to show wear but i can't master none of them womenish tricks my sister she tinkers em up she said last time she was here that she guessed they'd last my time the old ones are always the prettiest i said you ain't referrin to the braided ones now answered mr tilly you see ours is braided for the most part and their good looks is all the beginning poor dear used to say they made an easier floor i go shuffling round the house same as if twas a bolt and i always used to be stubbin up the corners of the hooked kind her and me was always havin our jokes together same as a boy and girl outsiders never know nothin about it to see us 
She had nice manners with all, but to me there was nobody so entertaining. She'd take off anybody's natural talk winter evenings when she set here alone, so you'd think twas them a speaking. There, there. I saw that he had dropped a stitch again, and was snarling the blue yarn around his clumsy fingers. He handled it and threw it off at arm's length as if it were a cod line, and frowned impatiently, but I saw a tear shining on his cheek. I said that I must be going, it was growing late, and asked if I might come again, and if he would take me out to the fishing ground some day. "'Yes, come any time you want to,' said my host. "'Tain't so pleasant as when poor dear was here. Oh, I didn't want to lose her, and she didn't want to go, but it had to be. Such things ain't for us to say. There's no yes and no to it.' "'You find Elmiry Todd one of the best of women?' said Mr. Tilly as we parted. He was standing in the doorway, and I had started off down the narrow green field. "'No, there ain't a better-hearted woman in the state of Maine. I've known her from a girl. She's had the best of mothers. You tell her I'm liable to fetch her up a couple or three nice good mackerel early tomorrow,' he said. "'Now don't let it slip your mind. Poor dear, she always thought a sight of Elmiry. "'and she used to remind me that there was nobody to fish for her, "'but I don't recollect it as I ought to. "'I see you drop a line yourself very handy now and then.' "'We laughed together like the best of friends, "'and I spoke again about the fishing grounds, "'and confessed that I had no fancy for a southerly breeze and a ground swell. "'Nor me neither,' said the old fisherman. "'Nobody likes em, say what they may. "'Poor dear was disobliged by the mere sight of a boat.' "'Elmiry's got the best of mothers, I expect you know, Miss Blackett out to Green Island. "'And we was always planning to go out when summer come. "'But there, I couldn't pick no day's weather that seemed to suit her just right. "'I never set out to worry her neither. "'Twain't no kind o' use. "'She was so pleasant we couldn't have no fret nor trouble. "'Twas never you dear and you darling afore folks, and you divil behind the door.' As I looked back from the lower end of the field, I saw him still standing, a lonely figure in the doorway. Poor dear, I repeated to myself half aloud. I wonder where she is and what she knows of the little world she left. I wonder what she has been doing these eight years. I gave the message about the mackerel to Mrs. Todd. Been visiting with Lija, she asked with interest. I expect you had kind of a dull session. He ain't the talking kind. Dwelling so long a fish seems to make him lose the gift of speech. But when I told her that Mr. Tilly had been talking to me that day, she interrupted me quickly. Then twas all about his wife, and he can't say nothing too pleasant neither. She was modest with strangers, but there ain't one of her old friends can ever make up her loss. For me, I don't want to go there no more. There's some folks she miss and some folks she don't when they're gone. "'But there ain't hardly a day I don't think of dear Sarah Tilly. "'She was always right there, yes. "'You know just where to find her, like a plain flower. "'Lijah's worthy enough. "'I do esteem Lijah, but he is a plodding man.'" End of chapter 20"'and when a boat came in from deep sea-fishing, "'they were never too far out of the way, "'and hastened to help carry it ashore two by two, "'splashing alongside, or holding its steady head, "'as if it were a willful sea-colt. "'As a matter of fact, no boat could help being steady "'and way-wise under their instant direction and companionship. "'Abel's boat and Jonathan Bowden's boat "'were as distinct and experienced personalities "'as the men themselves.' and as inexpressive. Arguments and opinions were unknown to the conversation of these ancient friends. You would as soon have expected to hear small talk in a company of elephants as to hear old Mr. Bowden or Elijah Tilly and their two mates waste breath upon any form of trivial gossip. They made brief statements to one another from time upster pots. The very boats seemed to be taking an afternoon nap in the sun. I could hardly discover a distant sail as I looked seaward, except a weather-beaten lobster smack, which seemed to have been taken for a plaything by the light airs that blew about the bay. It drifted and turned about so aimlessly in the wide reach off Burnt Island, 
that I suspected there was nobody at the wheel, or that she might have parted her rusty anchor chain while all the crew were asleep. I watched her for a minute or two. She was the old Miranda, owned by some of the Kaplans, and I knew her by an odd shaped patch of newish duck that was set into the peak of her dingy mainsail. Her vagaries offered such an exciting subject for conversation that my heart rejoiced at the sound of a hoarse voice behind me. At that moment, before I had time to answer, I saw some. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, February 2006. The Country of the Pointed Furs by Sarah Orne Jewett. Chapter 20 Along Shore. One day, as I went along the shore beyond the old wharves and the newer, high stepped fabric of the steamer landing, I saw that all the boats were beached, and the slack water period of the early afternoon prevailed. Nothing was going on, not even the most leisurely of occupations, like baiting trawls or mending nets, or repairing something large and shapeless flung from the Miranda's deck that splashed the water high against her black side, and my companion gave a satisfied chuckle. The old lobster smack's sail caught the breeze again at that moment, and she moved off down the bay. Turning, I found old Elijah Tilly, who had come softly out of his dark fish-house as if it were a burrow. "'Boy got kind of drowsy steerin' of her. Monroe he hove him right overboard. Wake now fast enough,' explained Mr. Tilly, and we laughed together. I was delighted for my part that the vicissitudes and dangers of the Miranda in a rocky channel should have given me this opportunity to make acquaintance with an old fisherman to whom I had never spoken. At first he had seemed to be one of those evasive and uncomfortable persons who are so suspicious of you that they make you almost suspicious of yourself. Mr. Elijah Tilly appeared to regard a stranger with scornful indifference. You might see him standing on the pebble beach or in a fish-house doorway, but when you came nearer he was gone. He was one of the small company of elderly, gaunt-shaped, great fishermen whom I used to like to see leading up a deep-laden boat by the head, as if it were a horse, from the water's edge to the steep slope of the pebble beach. There were four of these large old men at the landing, who were the survivors of an earlier and more vigorous generation. There was an alliance and understanding between them, so close that it was apparently speechless. They gave much time to watching one another's boats go out or come in. They lent a ready hand at tending one another's lobster traps in rough weather. They helped to clean the fish or to sliver porgies for the 